Do you yeah. recommend, because when I had problems with my breathing years ago, I, I was waking up with a dry mouth and I went to the, uh, to the doctor and they said, well, we don't need to do a sleep study on you because you don't fit the typical description of somebody with sleep apnea because they're looking for somebody who's obese. Uh, yeah. What, what Big would mistake. somebody like me do? We're an athlete and, and we go to the doctor and they say, well, you know, you don't fit that bill. Like that it's probably not the problem. Do you start with just the nasal breathing stuff, taping the mouth, or do you think you should do like an actual sleep study? Well, you could do a sleep study because it's absolutely no harm. You know, 50% of people with obstructive sleep apnea are not obese. So straight off and 25% are not tired, neither subjectively nor objectively are they tired the following day. I wrote a paper with two ear, nose and throat doctors, which was published in January of last year, breathing and the phenotypes of sleep apnea looking at the importance of how you breathe during the day, how it impacts your breathing during sleep. So if we have faulty breathing during the day, if our bowl score is less than 25 seconds, I'm not talking about 22 seconds or 21 seconds. I'm talking about if your bowl score is 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 seconds and around there. That implies that your breathing is harder and faster. And when we think of turbulence in the airway, it's not just the anatomy that we need to be considering. The doctor looks solely at the anatomy. They're looking at how big is the pipe, but they're not asking the question, what's actually going through it? Because the harder and the faster you breathe, the greater the friction that's developed as you're breathing through that narrow airway. So what we're saying is let's change your breathing pattern so that your breathing isn't hard and fast. Your breathing is becoming lighter. And by doing this, we can reduce turbulence. And also we want to be breathing nose slow and low because when we breathe with optimal movement of the diaphragm, it doesn't just impact our movement or the emotions, but the diaphragm breathing muscle is also linked, mechanically linked with the airway dilator muscles in the throat. So we have to think of the airway as one airway. And if the lower part of the airway, if the lungs and the diaphragm are not working as best as they should be, that's going to impact the upper airway and vice versa. So I think there's a huge role for this in sleep. And the other thing, Paul, is, you know, if you were to get a positive diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea, the gold standard of treatment is a CPAP machine. Now, a CPAP machine is what's called continuous positive airway pressure. It works, but it's a device whereby you're wearing a face mask or a nasal cannula, and it's forcing air down your throat at a sufficient pressure to splint open the airways. And the problem is it's not sexy. So you think of young, young guys or gals and you have a bed partner and you want to kind of look your best and you're jumping into bed with this big device. Well, that's the device gone straight off. And number two is the compliance is not high. 50% of people can't tolerate it. So even if you got a positive diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea, what is the best treatment out there available? The CPAP machine, which 50% of the population can't tolerate. Mandibular advancement, which works but can put a lot of pressure on the TMJ, the temporal mandibular joint. So, and I'm not saying that I'm not anti any of these, but the reason that breathing has not taken off is because you cannot scale it. I will never be a multimillionaire from teaching breathing exercises because it's just something that's free. And I put it into a book and yes, of course, I have a lovely living from it, but we're not going to get the research because it doesn't promise the big profit that is normally available for devices in the sleep industry. And it is a big industry. It's a billion, multi-billion dollar industry worldwide. 30% of men suffer from obstructive sleep apnea, 30%, depending on the age and especially as they get a bit older as well. And the other thing I say is, if you say, for example, your athletes are really working hard during the day and you're, you know, you're, you're physically, you're stressing the heart, which is good by doing physical exercise. But then if you're stopping breathing during sleep, you're also stressing the heart, which is not good. The heart is not getting recovery. And then when, when I hear of more so the bigger guys, like oftentimes it's the rugby guys, the big guys with a larger neck circumference, and I'm 48 years of age, and I'm hearing of a guy of a 40-year-old, and he's after dying because of a heart attack, and I'm just thinking to myself, did anybody ask, how was this guy sleeping? You know? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I saw you guys had a, a post on the the soccer player stuff. You know, there's like five guys yes. that are getting these like heart arrhythmias. I don't know the exact diagnosis, but all of a sudden these guys who are in great shape are like, there's like five of them this year that are out. And I think you mentioned like they some of these guys are having their, their mouth open at all times. You could just see, see the pictures and, and they're not nasal breathing. And I think it's, it's mm -hmm. tough for people to make that connection because it seems like two different worlds, but it's not. Totally, totally. And you know what? The, the post wasn't perfect either. I didn't write the article, even though I put a chapter about into the book, The Oxygen Advantage. The article was written by a physiologist, but the post should have been changed. It wasn't necessarily mouth breathing. It's hyperventilation. The only thing is, though, if you're breathing hard and fast through the mouth, you would be more likely to hyperventilate than if you were breathing through your nose. And the article drew a lot of criticism, you know, which I suppose, okay, but the people who were making the criticism don't realize that if you're breathing harder and faster and you're blowing off too much carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs, blood vessels constrict. And the heart is not just the organ that is here for pumping blood throughout the body. The heart needs its own blood flow, its own blood supply and its own oxygen delivery. So when we breathe hard and fast and our blood vessels are constricting, we can be depriving the heart of blood and oxygen delivery. And it has been shown, and I put that chapter back in 2016 into the oxygen advantage, that you know the, the electrical conduct of the heart can be affected as a result of hyperventilation. And even in the real world, when CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation professionals were coming across a victim, and if they gave them too much ventilation, it showed that they were killing the victim. And since 2007 or 2008, going back not, not a whole long time ago, they have removed ventilation and they only now do chest compressions. They didn't remove ventilation because of hygiene. They removed ventilation because a professional coming across a victim overzealous, just giving the person too much air, and it was having a negative effect.